Uh, it's my honor to give you two of the smartest, most thoughtful men I know, Richard Vague and Ali Belshi. I need that back from you. Uh, thanks to all of you for being here this morning. It's fantastic just to see people uh, together uh, in, a, in a room in a, at a beautiful event at this beautiful place. And it's great to be back with my friend Richard. Richard and I have had uh, remarkable in-depth conversations over the years about a number of topics. But when Jeff introduced him as a thought leader, I thought that's really important because you can't just be a thought leader because you want to be. And you can't just be a thought leader because you're smart. You have to, have, have to do things. You have to take action. And the action that Richard takes uh, is very specific. He, he reads. He's a, he's a student of history. Uh, he has had a great deal of experience in the business world. But more importantly, he, has, he does something that, that I do. Uh, in fact, I'm leaving tonight for San Antonio where I'm going to do something I do very regularly. For those of you who watch my show, I, I, I go out to different parts of the country and I meet with small groups of people. I meet with six people at a time and we talk about issues that are current in that moment. I started doing it actually after the, the murder of Je uh, George Floyd because of the social movements last year and it evolved into discussions about COVID and then discussions about the election and then discussions about social justice. And uh, I, I find there's nothing like it. We, these, are, these are six uh, people who are not there by virtue of their position or positions they hold. You know, sometimes I'll make sure that there's someone from the faith community or a police officer or a firefighter or, but generally speaking, they're just people who live in their communities and don't feel heard uh, and that is an underpinning of, of some of the, uh, the complaints that we have in society. But more than that, Richard has written a book that you are going to want to give people uh, on the holidays. It is a beautiful, beautiful book. Um, and it's sort of inadvertent because it started as uh, a, a lists that, that he thought would be interesting to people about companies and people who had met with economic success. Uh, over the history of the United States. And it became something so much bigger than that that the lists are almost incidental. If you didn't know the lists were in there, or if you didn't know that was the goal, you wouldn't know that because it is vignettes about pieces of American history and people in American history, uh, economic history, business history, who are so important. And part of Richard's thinking about this is that lots has been written on political history and social history and military history, in fact, in most countries. Uh, but little has been written uh, about business history in this way. And business and economic history are so incredibly tied to what America is today, for better or for worse. Some people would say it's bad and some people would say it's good. But for, whatever, for better or for worse, if you read this, or you share this book with your friends, you'll have the basis for good argument, which is what one wants, right? One wants to set the table for, for a great argument. So I want to start very briefly, Richard, with the why. I always want to know why somebody wrote this book, and I, I know you've had a bit of this conversation with Larry Platt in the past, but, but it's a very interesting outcome, and, and like so many interesting things in life, it's not exactly what you planned when you started it. Uh, thank you, Allie. I'd, I'd like to briefly say how thankful I am to you. Allie is America's finest journalist. It's a privilege to be with him here. Larry Platt has become, I think, Philadelphia's most important voice. And Larry, thank you for being here uh, and, and being so helpful to me. I'd like to thank Mary Francis. My publisher is here. So I don't know if you can raise her. There she is. Uh, thanks to you. And my wife and constant companion, the wonderful Laura Vegas, is here as well. So I'd like to thank them and so many other folks. But the why was, we were doing, a, a, writing a book about the financial history uh, of, of economic calamities in the United States. And that really starts in 1792 and 1796. And we had calamities from the very beginning. But as I was writing that and doing my research, I noticed most of the available the information on the early 1800s and the late 1700s simply wasn't available. We didn't even know who the big businesses were in those era. And so we started trying to assemble that information, and that led us to the thought that nobody had written a business history of the United States, as remarkable as that sounds. So we kind of took it off. 
uh, four pages into the book, you you have your first uh, meaningful. You've got actually you've got several lists before that, but you've got the list of the largest industries in 1791. Uh, just useful to know: uh, products made from animal hides, products made from iron, products made from wood, products made from flax and hemp, earthen goods, distilled and fermented beverages. Uh, paper goods, products made of animal hair and silk, sugar refining, oils, copper goods, tin goods, carriages, tobacco, starch goods and hair powder, pigments, and gunpowder. You know, it just takes you back a little bit into where we were in 1791. Two pages after that. So this is a, this is a big book. Uh, it is 315 pages with indices and appendix, appendix. On page six, you hit slavery for the first time. And one of the things you note is a statistic that many people note, but often without the important footnote. And it is that uh, very soon after uh, becoming its own country, uh, America uh, exceeded the gross domestic product of uh, its, the, the country it had come from, from Great Britain. And then soon after that, all of Europe and, and China, which uh, many people will remember post pre-industrial China was the largest economy uh, in the world, uh, and, and was really the biggest deal, but you know, from then to about the Second World War. And you, you talk about slavery, you have um, vignettes of enslaved people, you have vignettes of black people and people of color throughout the book in a way that most uh, business history books are, are remiss. But there is an interesting concept that, that slavery allowed the United States to be as um, robust economically as it was because there was a, a, an abundance of free labor and because of slavery some cheap labor as well. And when slavery ended all the way through to Reconstruction and beyond, sl free, free or cheap labor persisted for a long time. And when we sort of put an end to some of that, uh, we still have a federal minimum wage at seven and a quarter, but we found the places in the world that had the freest or close to cheap labor. So for years, chocolate, textiles, to this day, things we buy are based on the cheapest place in the world we can make it. That trend has never stopped. Slavery is over in almost all of the world, but the trend toward the cheapest cost of the production of goods continues. And there are a lot of people today, politically, who say maybe that shouldn't be the way we think about labor. Maybe we need to think about people more than the output of people. And I'm curious as to what your thought is as we evolve into what is starting to feel like hopefully a fairer society. Labor is the thing upon which America was built. Labor is still the thing that we will build our societies on in the future. What are your thoughts on labor and wages? <clears throat> well, the history of enslaved people in the United States is genuinely tragic. And I would note, in 1860, just to give you a sense of it, the collective wealth of the North was about 10 billion. The collective wealth of the South was about 6 billion. Half of that, 3 billion, was the value of the slaves that they owned. Further, there was actually debt on those enslaved people. And if we, by our estimate, uh, there were slave mortgages Many of those mortgages written by northern banks, by the way, including the Second Bank of the United States, was about 20% of the value of the slaves. So folks in the South were entrenched in that system, and it's easier for me to understand the calamity of the Civil War when I understand half of the value of the wealth in the South was slaves, and there were mortgages on those slaves. And so that's a tragedy. And, and, and clearly there was value created there, but it was tragic value, and we see that around the world. I think we have the opportunity in the modern world with technology and automation to really elevate everything. I think there's a, a path for us to get out of low cost everything. A lot of that labor can be handled otherwise, and through education folks can reach meaningful, substantive, stimulating jobs. I really think that's a path we can follow. Richard, you talk about, you, you jump to the 1860s and um, worth noting that in, in between 1851 and 1860, this is of course pre uh, the Civil War, uh, the, the top exports were still to uh, Great Britain, South and Central America, France and other European countries. There was uh, trade to Cuba and then China after that. 
my home country, Canada, is way down the list. Um, of the things exported, 1851 to 1860, as you would guess, cotton is at the top of that le list, wheat and wheat flour, leaf tobacco. Number four, by a very long shot, is manufactured goods. Most manufactured goods at the time were made in the north of the United States. Most uh, agricultural goods were made in the south. After manufacturing came lumber. Uh, so you can see a world in which the, the economies of the north and south were entirely different things in the period leading up to uh, the Civil War. How do you deal with that today? What, how, what does that make you think of where we are today? Are we a well-diversified country now? I still go to pockets of this country where you can see the old remnants of an old mining uh, industry or an old uh, you know, manufacturing industry. But fundamentally, have we, in your opinion, diversified enough as a country where we're not going to have regions that are just about uh, one or two things that are far ahead of uh, other things, or are we still, I mean, we still have parts of this country that are mainly agricultural. We still have some parts of these countries uh, around here and northeast of here that are mainly uh, financial or service oriented. Talk to me about how you see this country being sustainable because it's, it's balanced in its output. Uh, yes, it's remarkable how divided we were in, you know, from the 1820s to the 1860s, and it really started well before the Civil War, the division. We saw the attempted annulment in South Carolina in the late 1820s. The acrimony at that time, I don't think, has ever been exceeded, even though, unfortunately, we're kind of getting, we're getting close. We're getting close to that again, I think, for the first time uh, since that era. So, and, and I do think there continue to be divisions. You know, you and I have both spent a lot of time in rural America, in uh, small towns and rural states. And it does feel like there's a vast gulf between those two. And if you look at a map, I think one of the most remarkable maps I ever saw was population density in about eight, in 1960 compared to the way it is today. And uh, the population was more spread out through the country. Folks have been abandoning these smaller states and cities. And the map looks totally different today. There's a concentration on the coast, and there's kind of an evacuation, if you will, of the center country. So I do think we have a dilemma in front of us that's approaching that level. But I also think we have a way out. I think there's dynamic new industries in front of us. We have Jonathan Epstein from Penn here, who runs the research and development area of Penn, which is so vibrant, and produced the mRNA vaccine. And others. genetic engineering has the chance of revolutionizing our country. Uh, uh, immersive technologies such as VR and AR have the opportunity to change our country. I think there's a way forward that's less geography dependent that can elevate us all. Uh, before I ask the next question, I just want to ask you, for those of you who have not read the book, I'm, I'm up to about 1890 now, I'm moving fast through this book. Um, largest industry in the country by revenue in uh, in 1890. Any guesses? No wrong answers. No, this isn't a class. No one's getting graded. I heard steel. I heard rail. It's rail. Uh, the top 10 companies by revenue were railroad companies, and the top 10 companies by assets were railroad companies. Railroads were the biggest thing at the end of the uh, 19th century. Uh, Richard, these are just fun little tidbits in here. It's just fun to know. Uh, the world in which we exist right now, this world of protest, of anger at government, uh, of populism and nativism, it exists everywhere. There are a whole lot of people, um, I, I don't care who feels like getting political here or not. I'm a TV commentator, so I'm fine with it. Um, there are a whole lot of people who were quite clear that it was Trump, and with Trump gone, things are going to settle down. This nativism and populism exists in most countries around the world. It exists less in places like Canada, where I'm from, or northern European countries, um, in large part because the social safety net is very strong there. Healthcare is covered um, not by corporations. Uh, education, higher education is subsidized. So a lot of the things that make people angry are taken care of by the government. 
But the Arab Spring was an economic issue. The Arab Spring was a fruit vendor who set himself on fire because he said, I've done everything that you people have asked me to do, and I still can't make a living uh, selling fruit. The protests through, that went through Europe, Brexit was an economic thing. You can say it's about immigrants, but it's really about immigrants taking your jobs and making your wages lower. Here in the United States, we know for a fact that neither immigrants nor refugees have a, a, a depressing effect on wages. We are actually short of labor, and yet concerns about immigration are, are one of the biggest things around. And people have been successful in pitting Americans against each other as groups, uh, as a way of dealing with their, their grievances, when in fact economic inequality is a policy issue. It's not actually about groups that have taken your, your wealth away. People should be angry, but I, I happen to think they should be focusing on government and government policies and trade policies and things like that to say, how do we get a, a fairer shake? This populism is not ending anytime soon. It takes real important leadership to say, yeah, the world has got a lot of resources and it's, a, it's an unequal place. How do you see that fixing? You just want me to fix inequality here? Yeah, that's it. So, so, and in a couple of minutes so we can get to the next question. <laughs> Yeah, the, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a couple of things. One of the things I'm going to say is leadership in difficult times like this needs to exhibit grace, graciousness, love. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons we all continue to revere Abraham Lincoln is in the middle of the most contentious era in American history. He spoke in a way that was inclusive. He spoke in a way that elevated folks. Um, so I think we individually in our own lives have the opportunity to show that kind of grace. Uh, I, I think our, we, we can call on our leaders to do the same thing. But now I'm going to say something about inequality um, that's a little bit controversial. I, when I say this, everybody in the room may disapprove of me, but I'll say it anyway. I think, I think there's a, the reason we have the populism that we have is because the average Americans across the country are in fact suffering. We, Allie and I have both spent a lot of time on the road. Laura was with me on a lot of these visits. And the folks out there that represent, I think, the average Americans, I think have a legitimate claim that nobody's reaching out to help them. I think the cliche, of course, is the Republican Party helps the wealthy. The Democratic Party helps the disadvantaged. That's a cliche. There's a bit of truth in that. I think folks out there feel like nobody's trying to help them. And as we, I went across the country, people really do have only a couple hundred dollars in their bank account across the United States. Health care costs really are killing the average American. And nobody seems to be focused on that. People are in desperate need of upskilling. You know, there's big folks out there who... You know, offshoring has eliminated their jobs. They've gone from making, you know, $70,000 a year or $50,000 to making $20,000 a year. They're, they're desperate. Uh, they feel uh, like they've been abandoned. Uh, there's jobs that, that, that we could train them for that could change their lives, and, and we're not doing that. So I think there's a big job out there just to help average folks. And I think, finally... Uh, I will say, in fact, we are the most unequal point we've been, probably, except for a couple of moments over the last 250 years. We were at a similar point in the late 1800s, early 1900s. We were at our most equal point after World War II, uh, ironically enough. I think doing things that reintroduce, that reduce our Gini coefficient, if you, you follow economics, uh, are important things. So let's discuss the, um, the, the fundamental ways in which that can happen. I have this discussion with a lot of people, arguments sometimes. Um, I'm a business reporter. I have been for close on 30 years. Uh, I'm a capitalist. I think, I think the system is the best way out of it. I also think it's the flaw. It's the, it's the way in which we have uh, failed to distribute our wealth well. Uh, to all the parties involved. And this isn't talking about taking wealth and giving it to entirely unrelated people, but the, the way companies 
profit, but their employees don't. And the way social services are regarded as a sort of a, a we're kind of stingy with them with people. Uh, Andrew Yang got into the presidential election talking about a universal basic income, which is a, an interesting concept that manifests many different ways. What, what's the way in which we, you are so willing and able, as I am, to criticize what's wrong with our capitalism, yet you fundamentally embrace it. What's the way in which we, we the fear is that if you take away capitalism, you end up with socialism. And I don't think either of us are sitting here thinking that that's the right idea. Uh, we want the incentives that create the wealth and the, 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 the wealth generation that we've got now, but we want a, a, a better sense of fairness. You touched on it, better education, but generally speaking, what do you see on offer, meaning that people have suggested, that we can do to make our great economy a fairer economy going forward so that the next installment of this book is how in the 21st century we got fair? You know, one of the things I would say is uh, government has always been deeply involved in, in economic and business matters. So there's a little bit of a myth that, uh, you know, the great times in America have come when the government backed up off and got out of the way. I think as I've examined history, government has been deeply involved in business since the American Revolution. The government actively went out and trained manufacturers on how to build weapons by you know, having you know, interlocking parts and uh, replaceable parts and things like that. The government was deeply involved right after that, including folks like Alexander Hamilton and Tinch Cox, involved in stealing the secrets of the Industrial Revolution from Britain and seeding the Industrial Revolution in America as a result. It was overt investment by the government. Government financed the Erie Canal, which was transformational in American history. The government financed much of the railroad industry, which, as Ali's already said, was the, the behemoth in the 1800s. The railroad industry is what took America to economic leadership of the world. Most of the government gave away 150 million acres to help finance that. The government has involved, I think somebody said, you know, the, um, the iPhone has 13 major components. Every one of those is dependent directly or indirectly on government-funded research. Internet, the start of the internet was funded by the government. GPS technology, uh, touch technology, uh, you know, all the major components. So business has been vital, but government has been a successful partner. So I hope I'm not covering the transponder. I, 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 <laughs> they need a little, little thing to you, tell you, you where ask, it is. You ask what, what government can do practically. So there, I'll give you one example of a firm I know that is teaching coding. And it's a 13-week program. This is in this region, by the way. 13-week program. It's taking folks that are making minimum wage type jobs uh, in partnership with businesses. You know, it'll partner with businesses that'll fund part of this expense and guarantee to hire graduates of this program. The average person going into this program comes out with a salary two and a half times greater than the salary that they had going into the program. So they're going from 20,000 a year to 50,000 or 40,000 a year uh, to almost 100,000 a year. That kind of program writ large, I think could fundamentally transform a lot. So that's just one tiny example of what might be done. You uh, divide American uh, business history into 14 uh, segments, 14, 14 eras, and uh, I want to talk now about roughly the end of the First World War, uh, 1719 to 17, to, sorry, 1919 to about 1930. That's actually where now either we've built out enough railroads or most of them and, and, and emphasis starts to shift uh, elsewhere. In 1927, the largest industries in the United States were uh, metal, metal production and machinery. U.S. Steel was the largest company by, uh, by total revenue. Uh, then it was agriculture. That was the second biggest thing. And then it was manufacturing of a sort and manufacturing of a sort and manufacturing of a sort and transportation and warehousing of all the manufactured goods. 
Then it was banking, electric, because we had uh, started to electrify. Uh, so electric and gas and, and telephone utilities, because people started to have phones. Uh, mining and professional services were the last two of the top 10 back in the day. So we had emerged into uh, the manufacturing sector and quite differently from the, uh, from the transport sector, from trains or steel, the manufacturing sector is what began to build on this thing that we call the American middle class, which worked in many cases in factories, had a, a high school education, if that, and prospered, and were generally speaking able to buy a house in a place like Philadelphia uh, and create a better life than their parents did and hope for a better life than their kids did. This persisted until the 80s, probably, the 70s and the 80s, uh, and then something happened, lots happened. Technology happened, and some of those jobs went away to technology. This chase for low wages happened because trade became much more liberal and China became available. Uh, and Bangladesh and the Philippines. And we haven't quite recovered from that fully. I think we, we probably, but before the end, before the beginning of the coronavirus, we had gotten to a point where we had low unemployment. We've now started to see wages rising at a, a, a rate that I, I think is not bad. It's, it's, it's what people have been fighting for to have a legislated uh, minimum wage, which we don't have. It's still seven and a quarter, but the average wage is now much higher than that. We are now for the first time fixing what broke from manufacturing and outsourcing and automation. Tell me how that looks to you. Yeah, I don't want to sound repetitive here, but I think that uh, we lost a lot of jobs. We lost hundreds of thousands and millions of jobs from let's call it the 1980s and 90s to the present, most of those in manufacturing. You know, I can't begrudge uh, you know, a single company who saw it to maximize value for their shareholders by outsourcing. I do think we missed the opportunity to take the folks who had lost their jobs in that context and retrain them to vibrant new jobs. Uh, there's countries that do that. That was an opportunity for us that we missed. Uh, everybody wins. You know, right now, we go around and I find con company after company that wants more employees that's having a hard time getting the kind of qualified employees that that they need. I think there's a role there uh, for government uh, uh, to assist. So, uh, and I don't want to say, I don't want to harp on one thing too much, but that's an obvious huge gap in what's going on in the United States. Richard, thank you as always. It is so, when, when Larry asked me if I would do this, it was like, one doesn't have to ask me if I will sit in conversation uh, with Richard Vague. But uh, as always, you've given us an, an amazing book. For those of you who don't have it, I'm just telling you, uh, it'll make you smart to, uh, to read it. It'll make you seem really smart to give it to somebody else. Uh, thanks a million, Richard. I'll hand it back to, uh, to Larry.